Hello and welcome to the BWBC Online Weekly Bible Study Lesson. Our prayer is that something will be said to bless you and your walk with the Lord. Welcome to our uh, uh, midweek Bible study at Ben Washington Baptist Church, the church where everybody knows your name. Amen. We are so excited to be here. Uh, we are today in Revelations chapter 5. Chapter 5, along with chapter 4 in the book of Revelation, are two chapters that are covering events in heaven immediately before the tribulation period began. And so on last week's lesson, uh, John was caught up to heaven and he saw some things in heaven that caused him to... Uh, be amazed at what he saw and he also saw that in heaven they don't walk around all day they praise the lord but so in revelations chapter 5 well i'll just begin reading because i just love reading god's word the book of revelation is the only book in the bible that has a blessing by uh in chapter one blessed are those who read and keep the words of this prophecy and so th there's a blessing when you study the book of Revelation. Why is there a blessing? Because you get to know in advance what's going to happen before it happens. And so you look forward with anticipation, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in Revelation chapter 5, John is still recording what he saw in the heavens. It says in verse 1, And I saw... In the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals? And no one in heaven or in earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look on it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, had prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the, twenty, of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and had made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them were ten thousands times ten thousands and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and as such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessed and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders found, fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and forever. Now, We've read the entire chapter 5, but now we need to do the exegetive breakdown of what we have just read. Well, John is in heaven, and none of us have had the privilege of doing what John has done, which is 
to go up to heaven. And so John is describing for those who are on earth what heaven is like. And I believe that we need to have an accurate description and understanding of what heaven is like. The Bible teaches us that, that God lives in the third heaven. And the third heaven is the farthest of the heavens. And so in the third heaven, John was caught up. And while in heaven, in chapter 4, he noticed that there was universal praise going on because of the holiness of God. So every time the cherubims uh, would declare the holiness of God, the 24 elders who had crowns on their head would, would bow down and worship him. And so one of the things that we do know about heaven is that heaven is a place of worship. Amen? And so, but in chapter 5, John was looking at the throne of God, and God had in his hands uh, a scroll, and the scroll was written on the outside and on the inside. I don't know if, it, if there's any of you that are familiar with ancient scrolls, but, but a scroll was something that you had to unfold in order to, to read what was on the inside. And so here was a scroll that was written on the inside and the outside outside but it was sealed which means it had not been broken so the contents of what was sealed had not yet been declared because it was sealed and so there was an angel the Bible didn't just say any angel but it said there was a strong angel who made a proclamation and who said who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seal Okay, that was the question. Who's worthy to open the scrolls and the, and the lucid seal? And so the question that a lot of people have, who's worthy? Who's worthy of praise? Who's worthy of recognition? Have you ever seen people try to get recognized for something that they need to, need to set their tail down? Have you, have you ever seen people who start bragging on themselves when in truth of the matter they have no reason to brag? And so, and so uh, uh, the question is, there's a scroll that is sealed that is written on the inside and the outside, which the contents have not yet been declared. But the question arises in heaven is, who's worthy to loose the scrolls, to open the seals? And so that was the angel's declaration. And verse 3 says this. There was no one in heaven, no one on the earth, no one under the earth. Now, uh, is there anybody in the room you have fallen short of the glory of God? Anybody in the room you, 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 you strive for perfection, but you didn't make it? Uh, let me see. What would make Moses unworthy to open the scroll? Well, Moses had killed a man. What would make Paul unworthy to open the scroll? Paul had consented to the death of Stephen. What would make Abraham, the father of the faith, unworthy to open the scroll? Well, he, he lied about his wife, Sarah. What would make, what would make, uh, what would make uh, Jacob? unworthy. Well, he stole his brother's birthright. What would make Peter, the one who declared who Jesus is, uh, 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 what would make Peter unworthy? Peter had denied Christ. Now, you don't have to tell me what makes you unworthy, but is there something in your mind that comes to the surface of your mind that would make you unworthy? Maybe it, maybe it was something you did last night. Maybe it was something you done this morning. But, but uh, uh, to open this seal and the scroll, you had to be perfect. And the Bible says that there was no one on earth and no one under the earth. Now that tells us that, that even the dead, there's something that uh, makes them ineligible to open the scroll. 
But can you notice it says here that there's no one in heaven? Can, can you imagine that? No one in heaven. All those angels that have been created by God, the two-thirds of the angels who had not joined in the rebellion with Satan, the Bible says that they're not worthy. So when John heard that question and, and saw that no one stepped to the front and said, I'm worthy, verse 4 tells us he wept much. He didn't just cry. He wept. Have you ever, have you ever really wanted to know something but was deprived of knowing it and it caused you to cry? Have you ever uh, 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 thought about something that was so important to you, but you, fall sh you fell short? So John said he wept much because no one was found worthy to open, read, or even to look on it. Now, that's, now I, can, I can understand you not being worthy to open it, but he says here, not only are you not worthy to open it, not only are you not worthy to read it, but you're not even worthy to look on it. So whatever is in this scroll must be of such value that no one was worthy to open it, read it, or even look on it. So John cried. But then verse 5 says, but one of the elders, what's one of the 24 elders, said, do not weep. Why? Because the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seven seals. The question is, who is the lion of the tribe of Judah? And who is the root of David that now has prevailed? And how did he prevail to the point that he can open the seven seals? Well, so that I won't keep you in suspense, number one, there were 12 tribes of Israel. One of the 12 tribes was the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah had a symbol, and the symbol of the tribe of Judah was a lion. Uh, but the Bible also tells us that it was of the tribe of Judah that the Messiah would come. And, and the Messiah would come not only out of the tribe of Judah, but would be a descendant of David. Therefore, he would not only be the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he would also be the root of David. And the person that I'm speaking about is none other than Jesus the Christ. So Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So he's a lion. A lion is the king of the jungle. A lion is ferocious. A lion is powerful. So Jesus is a lion. And he represents the tribe of Judah, but he's also a root. And the, the important thing about a root is the fact that, that everything starts with the root. So Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he is the root of David. And the Bible says he has prevailed. Now, how is it that Jesus, or uh, what did he do to prevail? Can I tell you what he did, Clint Sutton, to prevail? Number one. Uh, uh, he took the keys of death and Hades from Satan. He took the keys of death and hell from Satan. Not only did he do that, but the Bible says he prevailed in the fact that he died for our sins, but that he was also resurrected. Now, is there anybody that you know of that died and was resurrected? As a matter of fact, Jesus is the first person to actually ever die and be resurrected. Now, he's not the first person to die and come back from death because Lazarus died and came back to life. Uh, the widow woman, uh, when Elijah uh, encountered her, uh, came back to death. Jesus raised uh, uh, a girl from from death from sleep so but they all died after they had been been brought back to life but Jesus was the first born to die to never die again and that's why he is the first born of many to come and so because of your faith in Jesus uh, and the fact of the resurrection just like he prevailed over death you one day will prevail over death
And that's good news. So that's why the Bible says we don't weep as those who have no hope because we know that the same Jesus who died and got up out of the grave one day will get us, get us up out of the grave. And therefore, the fact that he prevailed over death is exciting. But the Bible tells us this. In verse 6, the Bible says uh, the 24 elders saw someone in the middle of the throne, in the middle of the elders stand up. And here we are told about a sucking animal, totally opposite of a lion, and that is a lamb. Now what makes a lamb such a precious animal? Number one, lambs are not violent. Lambs are uh, vulnerable lambs uh, provide food, but lambs are also what is offered as a sacrifice. And so the same person who was described as a lion is also described in the Bible in chapter 5 as a lamb. So Jesus is the lamb. How is he a lamb? Because he offered himself as a sacrifice for the sins of humanity. And every time I think about what Jesus did on Calvary's cross, number one, he died for people who had not yet been born. Number two, he died for people who had not yet sinned. Number three, he died for people who had been born and who had sinned. But he also died for people who had been born, who had sinned, but who, who, but who still had sins to do. He died for the sins that they had not yet committed. So he died for all the sins of all the world for all the time. That's why Jesus does not have to go back to the cross every time you sin. Is there anybody here happy that Jesus does not have to go back and do it over and do it over and do it over? Because the truth of the matter, if Jesus had to die for our sins, he would never get off the cross. He would keep on dying. He would just stay right there, stay right there, stay right there. Because isn't it true that sometimes we just have a hard time stop doing wrong? You can, you can be in your bed. Just got, just woke up, and before your feet hit the floor, you didn't thought something that was evil. That's sin. You could, you could have gotten up out of your bed, not even made it to the kitchen, and, and you didn't say something to your spouse that you should not have said. That is what? Sin. You could, you could... Drive your car out of your garage and hit the highway, and before you get to work, you didn't say something or done something that is sin. So the Bible says that Jesus died once and for all for sin, never to have to go to the cross again. So, so his sacrifice is the eternal sacrifice. Now, he is described here as a lamb that had been slain. And... And how many of you know that he died, he was slain? Uh, Isaiah 53 describes him as a, a, a sheep who never said a mumbling word. He was led to the slaughter, but he never complained. He even had the grace to say, Father, forgive him, for they know not what they do. Then we're told here that he has seven horns, and the number seven represents completion. A horn represents power. But then we're also told that uh, he has seven eyes, and an eye which talks about the, the omniscience of God. You know, uh, you need to know that Jesus sees everything. We got two eyes, and we can see a lot. Sometimes we even say this, Brother Richardson, they got eyes behind the back of their head. And we say that because somehow they can see stuff that we didn't think they could see. Now, imagine what somebody can do with seven eyes compared to just two eyes. So Jesus is described as somebody who sees everything. And the reason why he can see everything is because he's omnipresent. 
And the reason why he can, he can, he's, he, he has the right to prevail is because of his divine attributes. But then we are told that the, the seven eyes are the seven spirits of God. And it's not talking about the fact that God has seven spirits. It's talking about the seven ministries of the Holy Spirit, which are found, for those of you that want to go there, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. Now, so the Bible says that he has prevailed, and so Jesus took the scroll that was written on the inside and the outside and took it from the Father. Now, here's the thing that you need to know about the scrolls and why it is so precious and why it is so important. Listen to this, Brother White. The scrolls reveal the future, and none of us know the future. Anybody remember the psychic hotline? And how people used to call into the psychic hotline and, and they would actually pay the person who, who ran the, the psychic hotline to tell their future and yet the psychic hotline didn't know enough about the future to know that they would go out of business. Isn't that rather ironic? that they would tell the future, but they couldn't tell the future that they would be out of business. Wow. Anyway, so the, the scrolls represent the future, and the question is, who knows the future? I don't know the future. Do you know the future, Jason? Clint, do you know the future? Anybody know what's going to happen the rest of 2020? Aren't you interested to know what's going to happen in the future? There was a, there was a Gentile king by, the king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar who, who wanted to know the future, and God was gracious enough to have him have a dream uh, that disturbed him. And in that dream that was so disturbing, uh, he was ready to kill all the people who supposedly could, could tell the future, and, and none of them could. And God had somebody by the name of Daniel, who, who Daniel prayed, and God told him what the dream was of the king and the interpretation. And Daniel in chapter 1 and chapter 2 said this, there's a God in heaven who knows the future. He's the one that has revealed to me what is going to happen in the future. So Jesus is the one who is worthy to open the seals to tell us what the future is. And when you study the book of Revelation, you're actually studying the future. Now, I want to say this before I forget. If you are desiring to get the handout that I've been uh, teaching from, will you call Sister Dunning at the church and say, uh, Pastor Sneed said I can get this. And so I can follow along with him because we will make sure that you, that you have copies to get. It's called the Book of Revelation, and it gives an outline of the entire book so you can follow along with me as we teach. And so right now we have covered the first three chapters, which is the, the church age, and we covered chapter four on last week, and now we're covering chapter five. And I want you to be able to follow along so you'll know what, what's in the rest of the book. So let's look and see what is said here in verse 8. It says, when, when Jesus had taken the scroll, the, le the living creatures, the 24 elders, they fell down before the lamb, and they were given a harp, and they were given a bowls, and the bowls are the prayer of the saints. And the Bible says they sang a new song. Now let me ask you a question. When Jesus, in, 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 uh, on the Sermon of the Mount, when the disciple had asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. Yeah. And Jesus said, pray in this manner. Our Father, which, what? Art in where? Heaven. And then he says, hallowed be thy, what? Name. Thy kingdom come, what? Thy will be done where? In, on earth as it's done where? In heaven. So the saints have been praying for over 2,000 plus years. Lord, thy kingdom come. That's the prayer. 
thy kingdom come. When Jesus was getting ready to uh, ascend into heaven, they asked him, Lord, when will you establish your kingdom? Jesus talked about a coming kingdom, okay? And so uh, he, he talked about establishing a kingdom on earth just like there is a kingdom where? In heaven. So the, there is no doubt that everyone in heaven does the will of God. There is a coming kingdom in which Christ will set up a kingdom where everybody on earth will imitate just like what everybody does in heaven. They're going to do the will of God in heaven, and they're going to do the will of God on earth. You should be living your life seeking to do the will of God. You want to know the will of God? Can I tell you? You cannot know the will of God without knowing the word of God. If you don't know the word of God, you don't know the will of God. How? I, because the Bible is, is comprised of two testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And, and, and the word for testament literally is the old will and the new will. So when you study the Bible, you're actually studying the will of God. So when you want to do the will of God, and uh, in order to do the will of God, you got to know the will of God. Well, to know the will of God is to know the word of God. So, here is Jesus who says that they have a bowl that contains the prayers of the saints. Anybody here ever had a parent who would make a cake? And they would they would make the cake in a big old bowl, and and uh, and it would chocolate cake. I'm, I'm I'm getting hungry right now thinking about it, but uh, I would just want to lick the bowl because the bowl has some sweet ingredients. All I'm trying to tell you is this: God has a bowl. It has to be pretty big. It contains the prayers of the saints from the earliest of time who've been praying that prayer, Lord, your kingdom come. You should get excited about that. Just like you're excited about that cake that's in the oven and you can't wait till it, 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 it's out of the oven so you can eat it, you ought to be excited that there's a coming kingdom and you're going to get to participate in it. All the songs that we sing here at Ben Washington Baptist Church and elsewhere we sing songs about the coming kingdom. We sing songs about the king. We sing songs because he's worthy. And the Bible says they sang a new song. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I don't sing very well. And before we started taping, I was trying to sing. And, and, and uh, Minister White told me I need to commit to sing. I need to commit. That if I just commit, and, and, and Derek told me that, that I do well as long as I don't move, but when I move, I lose it. And so, so uh, I'm excited that I'll be able to sing a new song. And listen to this, Brother Richardson. I'm going to sing a new song, and it's going to be on tune. And not only am I going to sing a new song, I'm going to know all the words to the song. The Bible says uh, they sang a new song. And, and I cannot tell you this. I'm going to be able to sing in the choir and y'all can't kick me out. Isn't that good news? As a matter of fact, you are going to be in the choir. So can I tell you about heaven? Everybody in heaven is in the choir. Now, I don't know if you can handle that, Derek. Everybody in heaven is in the choir. Everybody in heaven is, ooh, this is, we don't have specialized singers in heaven. Everybody sings. As a matter of fact, I can tell you about this, Brother Clint. You know how you sing uh, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, and you get real happy? You, you're not going to be singing Mississippi song. You're going to be singing heaven song. One heaven, two heaven, three heaven, four heaven. All right? And you're going to be singing. So the Bible says 
You, they sang a new song. But here, here, uh, here are the lyrics of the song. And you can start rehearsing right now. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God from your blood. Now, I'm getting happy right there. Out of, ooh, can I, I just noticed this. I'm giving you a glimpse of heaven. So it says here, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So the Bible tells us that, that there are going to be singers from all over the world. Yeah. All kinds of singers. So in this choir, there are going to be black people singing. There are going to be white people singing. There are going to be Asian people singing. There are going to be Hispanic people singing. Uh-oh, heaven is going to have an integrated choir. Uh-oh. Some of y'all getting mad right now because you thought that heaven was segregated. Bible says right here, out of every tribe. What does every mean? Every. So there's going to be some people from every group who will have accepted Jesus. And they're going to sing. And what is the song they're singing? You have redeemed us by your blood. Now, y'all do know what redeemed means, right? Bought you back. And what he, he paid the price for you to be in heaven. What, what did it cost him? It cost him his blood. And the Bible says in verse number 10, And you have made us kings and priests to our God. And we shall reign on earth. Now, one of the things I need to tell y'all, because I used to have the opinion, Clint, that uh, when I died, I would go to heaven and I would stay in heaven. But the Bible literally teaches that when Christ set up his kingdom, he's going to set it up on earth. And those who have received Jesus as their savior, the Bible says here, we're going to reign. Reign. I mean, we're going to rule as kings and as priests on earth. So there may be, listen to this, there's going to be a segment of the earth in which you're going to be able to rule during the kingdom. How long is the kingdom going to last? The Bible tells us that the kingdom is going to last for a thousand years on earth. So there's going to be a place for you where you will be a leader on, not on earth. Now, but you're going to have to have done something well during this lifetime in order for you to reign. Otherwise, your kingdom is going to be real, real small. You might just have a block. Others might have, others might have a neighborhood. Others might have a city. Others might rule over a state. What about you? Have you done enough for God to, to put you in charge? And to reign as king and priest. Now it says here in verse number 11. I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. How many angels? And, and, and the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them were 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. You know what? So what I did is I actually uh, took out my calculator and I did the math. What is 10,000 times 10,000? You know what 10,000 times 10,000 is? We know here that there's at least 100 million angels in heaven. But then it says... Not just 10,000 times 10,000. It also says there's more and thousands of thousands. So there's a myriad of angels in heaven who are singing to God. And there, and, and there are millions and millions of people that God has redeemed from the earth who's going to be singing. So can I tell you what we see in chapter 5? We see what I call universal praise. Everybody in heaven, Derek, is going to be praising God. So 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands. Look, and look what it says here in verse 12. You know how people, when they sing in the choir, sometimes you can barely get them to open their mouths? 
You ever experienced that, Derek? Have you, have you ever had to try to get people to sing loud and, and to project? Well, the Bible says here, they sang with a loud voice. Do you know that when you are passionate about something and when you feel it really, 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 really passionate, I mean, you don't mind it coming out. Am I right, Clint? When you were singing love songs to your wife when you were dating her, you weren't bashful, were you? You sung it out. Am I right? Brother Richardson, did you sing to your wife? I sung to my wife. When I did the serenade, I was loud. I wanted to express it. We have such a love for God, it's going to require us to sing with passion, and we're going to do it loudly. There are too many Christians on the earth who are timid on earth. Now, if we're to imitate what's going on in heaven, we ought to praise God loudly. Because guess what? They praise God loudly in heaven. Can I go on? Here's what it says. What did they say? Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power. Is he worthy to receive power? It says, and, and to receive riches. Is he worthy to receive riches? And wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Now look here. Verse number 13. I'm almost through with this chapter. Verse 13 says, and every creature in heaven and on earth uh-oh, and under the earth, and as such as are in the sea, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power to him who sits on the throne and the Lamb forever and ever. Now, can you imagine people who rejected the Lord during their lifetime are going to recognize that he's worthy? Can you imagine that those who did not recognize his kingship or his lordship on earth during their lifetime, after they have died, they're going to have to recognize it. Why is that? Because the Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, I, the thing I, I'll say to everybody who's listening to this, you need to either do it voluntarily now on earth or do it mandatory one day before you go to hell. But before you go to hell, you're going to recognize he's Lord. So can I get somebody to say he's Lord right now? He's Lord. He is Lord, he is master, he is ruler, he is wise, he has all power, he has all glory, he has all honor. And so when I get to heaven, I'm going to recognize his glory, his power, his wisdom, his strength, his might. And I'm going to bless him, I'm going to bless him loudly, I'm going to bless him Day and night, every time I hear the angels are flying around heaven say, holy, 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 I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to bow down and worship him. And the Bible says in the last verse in chapter 14, then the four living creatures said, amen. What does amen mean? Amen means so be it. Yeah. And the Bible says the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. The good news is the one we worship conquered death, demonstrated the power by the resurrection uh, from the Holy Spirit, and he reigns forever, and he took the keys of hell from Satan. And you and I have a right to reign with him on earth. So when he comes back, we're going to be right there with him. Now, before we close, we're going to be able to uh, next week, we're going to deal with the tribulation period. We want you to see what the last seven years on earth is going to look like for mankind. It's not going to be pretty. So uh, here's what I'll tell you. When you come to Bible study next week, bring your Bible, bring your hand out with you, and we're going to take you through the beginning of the tribulation period, and we're going to show you just how awful the last seven years of humanity will be. It's going to be scary if you're not a believer.
But if you're a believer, it's going to be good news. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for letting us see a glimpse of the one who is a lion as well as a lamb and who was slain for our salvation. And with his blood, we've been redeemed. And thank you, Father God, that you're able to reveal in advance what's going to happen on earth before your second coming. So I pray, oh God, that you would give us listening ears, open heart to receive your word. We pray for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to the BWBC online Bible study lesson. We pray that you have been blessed.